The interwar period in the United States was a time of profound turbulence and transformation. After the devastation of World War I and America's shift from an isolationist power to a global one, the nation struggled to redefine itself amidst growing economic disparity. The Roaring Twenties had given Americans a fleeting taste of prosperity, but beneath the surface, the foundations of that prosperity were fragile. By 1929, the stock market had crashed, and this sent shockwaves through the country, plunging the United States and much of the world into the depths of the Great Depression. As bread lines formed and grew and major cities and unemployment skyrocketed, many looked abroad for solutions in the face of this utter disaster. The rise of socialism in Russia and corporatism in Italy, where in both countries the state had taken control of large sectors of the economy, appeared to offer a way out. For many desperate Americans, these nationalized systems with their promises of a powerful government that could care for and protect its citizens seemed increasingly attractive. It was during this bleak and uncertain time that Franklin Delano Roosevelt rose to prominence. His New Deal, a pragmatic response to the economic crisis, embodied the growing desire for a strong interventionist government. FDR created federal government programs like the Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the Securities and Exchange Commission. He nationalized Social Security and really threw everything possible at the wall in order to provide relief to the suffering, restore confidence in the economy, and regulate the chaotic financial sector. His leadership would ultimately carry him through an unprecedented four terms in office, but Franklin Roosevelt was not the only figure challenging the status quo. Besides the second wave of progressivism, another political force emerged with a vision some might consider even more radical. He was called the Kingfish, and he would reshape not just his home state of Louisiana, but leave a lasting impact on the foundations of modern American populism to this day. His name was Huey Long. Huey Pierce Long Jr., born in the heart of rural Louisiana in 1893, grew up in the modest town of Winfield, a place that, like much of the Deep South, knew poverty all too well. The seventh of nine children, Huey was raised by parents who valued education and Christian morals and encouraged their children to rise above their humble circumstances. From a young age, he exhibited a gift for oration winning debate championships in high school, and honing the persuasive skills that would later define his career. In 1915, at just 22 years old, he passed the Louisiana bar exam and began practicing law in Winfield. It was in these early years, representing poor farmers in their battles against the powerful corporations that controlled Louisiana's wealth, that Long's populist message began to take shape. Huey Long's career took off in 1918, when he was elected to the Louisiana Railroad Commission. At the time, the state was a battleground between working-class citizens and corporate giants, most notably the Standard Oil Company, which had its tentacles in every rung of the political ladder of the state. Long was unrelenting in his attacks on these corporations, taking every case he could to challenge Standard Oil and other companies he considered to be unjust monopolies. His fiery anti-corporate rhetoric struck a chord with voters, many of whom felt powerless under the weight of corporate exploitation in their already impoverished circumstances. At this time, Louisiana was a state mired in poverty. The roads were notoriously terrible, often left unpaved for years, leaving many rural communities cut off, especially in the state's swampy terrain. During the rainy season, travel could become virtually impossible in some areas. Roughly 60% of the state population lived without access to electricity and running water even before the Great Depression. Utilities were controlled by private entities, and local governments had little influence over these essential services unlike today. This left the majority of the state's population dissatisfied and frustrated as they watched the state's wealth and resources be hoarded by the privileged few without any meaningful improvements to their own living conditions. Long suffered an early defeat in his political career in a 1924 gubernatorial race, but this didn't deter him. Instead, it allowed Long to fine-tune his message, sharpening his focus on the economic issues that would come to resonate with the voter base. In speeches, he rallied against the wealthy elites who, he argued, had taken control of the state while the masses suffered in poverty. Running on the slogan, every man a king but no one wears a crown, Long's message resonated with rural farmers, industrial workers, and those forgotten by the existing political system. His electoral victory was a landslide, 
96,000 votes to his opponent's 67,000, and his time as governor would see an unprecedented change in Louisiana. During this time in office, he levied taxes on wealthy corporations and entities. Using this money, he built roads, bridges, hospitals, and schools, physical symbols of progress in a state that had long lagged behind the rest of the country. Perhaps his most significant achievement was in education. Louisiana, known for having some of the lowest literacy rates in the country, saw a complete overhaul of its educational system. Long introduced free textbooks for school children, expanded access to higher education, and transformed Louisiana State University into a premier institution. His improvements were tangible and immediate, particularly for those who had never before benefited from government intervention. But Long's reforms didn't stop there. He introduced a series of taxes on luxuries such as gasoline, which, believe it or not, was indeed a luxury at this time, and also on certain commodities, ensuring that the wealthier citizens and corporations of Louisiana bore a larger share of the financial burden. In doing so, he took direct aim at the entrenched elites and large corporations, particularly, again, Standard Oil, that had long dominated Louisiana's economy. As he continued his governorship, Long's control over Louisiana increased tremendously as he sought to wring out corruption from the proverbial rag. Corruption in Louisiana was a serious drain on state resources and led to some of the money Long had accumulated with his reforms disappearing and not making its way down to the people it was intended for. In his crusade against corruption, he would actually purge political opponents from state offices, take control of the press by establishing his own media outlets, and centralize powers in ways that alarmed his critics. Detractors labeled him a dictator, accusing him of bypassing democratic processes to push through his agenda. But nevertheless, his popularity remained steadfast and even increased among the people of Louisiana, who saw him as a necessary force to counterbalance the dominance of the wealthy and the corrupt. His political rise would soon catch the attention of the nation as a whole, for in the face of the Great Depression, Huey Long had tapped into a deep vein of discontent. By the time he entered the U.S. Senate in 1932, Long was already a national figure, admired by many, feared by more. In response to the crushing effects of the Great Depression, he introduced his most famous initiative, the Share Our Wealth Program. Under this program, Long proposed a system of progressive taxation. For incomes over $1 million, there would be a 1% tax. For $2 million, a 2% tax. For $3 million, 3%, and so on. The plan capped personal fortunes at $50 million, or about $600 million in today's money, and set an inheritance limit of $5 million per person, about $60 million today. He also advocated for taxing large inheritances and ensuring a guaranteed basic income for every American family unit. Critics, as you might assume, painted him as a socialist or worse, but Long believed his plan was a moderate solution, one that would stave off the more extreme alternatives of communism or fascism, both of which were gaining traction around the world. His rhetoric continued to evolve as he positioned himself as the only leader capable of rescuing the nation from economic ruin. He openly criticized President Roosevelt and other political leaders for their ties to corporate interests, suggesting that the New Deal was not enough, and that true reform required bolder action. Long's message struck a chord with millions across the country, so much so that he reportedly received more letters from the public than President Roosevelt for a time. As economic hardship deepened, many Americans saw in Huey Long a champion who was willing to take on the wealthy and fight for the rights of the working class. By the build-up to the 1936 election cycle, it became clear that Long had ambitions far greater than the Senate seat he occupied. Behind closed doors, he believed only he could bring about the necessary changes to save the country from communism, fascism, and total economic collapse. Roosevelt would actually make efforts to co-opt elements of Long's platform to ensure he didn't pose a threat to his re-election. But Long was undeterred. He believed that the presidency was within his grasp, and that his message of economic justice would carry him to the White House. However, Huey Long's meteoric rise came to a tragic and sudden end on September 8, 1935. While in the Louisiana State Capitol, Long was shot by Carl Weiss, the son-in-law of a political opponent. Despite immediate medical attention, Long succumbed to his injuries two days later on September 10, 1935. He was only 42 years old.
But the sudden death of young Huey Long leaves us with an interesting and unanswered question. What if that had changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, Huey Long was never assassinated and instead ran and was elected President of the United States? Before beginning today's alternate history scenario, be sure to leave a comment and subscribe. If you want to help contribute to these scenarios or just have ideas you'd like to have made into videos, consider becoming a channel member or supporting us on Patreon. Thanks and enjoy the video. If you're already well versed in the life and times of Huey Long, you may already be familiar with a supposed presidential game plan of sorts attributed to Huey Long, one that outlined a bold, albeit risky, path to the Oval Office. The plan as it goes would hinge on the election of 1936, where Long intended to challenge Franklin D. Roosevelt for the Democratic nomination. Of course, given his greater popularity and more moderate progressive stance, Roosevelt would inevitably triumph in the primaries, sweeping most states and leaving Long on the outside. But Long was nothing if not a master strategist. In this plan, he would go on to launch an independent bid for the presidency, knowing full well the consequences. His candidacy would split the Democratic vote, ensuring a victory for the Republican candidate Alf Landon. Landon's victory, however, at least in Long's estimation, would not be a triumph for the American people. A liberal Republican who sought to balance the New Deal with fiscal conservatism, Landon's administration, in the plan, would find itself mired in political gridlock. Long essentially assumed that Landon's attempts to navigate the economic turmoil of the Depression would flounder, and the Depression would get worse. Now, is this realistic? Perhaps. Landon's economic policies probably would have alienated him from some more hardline laissez-faire Republicans, and he still wouldn't have the support of the Democrats, so it very well could be a situation where Landon can't pass any meaningful policy to help Americans during his four years in office. Then, it was assumed once all this had happened, the American people would become more receptive to Huey Long's radical solutions, and Long could sweep the presidency in 1940. Now, we cannot truly tell whether or not this was the actual plan that Huey Long intended to follow. Was he not assassinated in 1935, especially since Long himself claimed that his goal was squarely to win the presidency in 1936, not 1940? So for the sake of this scenario, we'll assume that Huey Long was elected in 1936 as the man the nation had been waiting for, a populist leader ready to reshape America. Well, unrealistic, this will give us a grace period before the outbreak of the Second World War, which will allow us to explore a more thorough scenario. Now, with Long in office, the question becomes, what will the Kingfish do? Well, what's nice for us is that Huey Long actually wrote a novel detailing just that. In 1935, the same year he was assassinated, he laid out everything from who would be in his hypothetical presidential cabinet, to what policy agenda he would carry out, to his views on foreign affairs, all in one book entitled My First Days in the White House. At the heart of his agenda were massive infrastructure projects that aimed to employ millions of Americans, rebuild the country's crumbling roads, bridges, and railways, and solve the natural catastrophes that had plagued the Midwest. Drawing from his experience as governor of Louisiana, where he had modernized the state's infrastructure, Long envisioned a vast network of dams, reservoirs, and canals that would rehydrate the Dust Bowl, protecting the nation from the ravages of drought and dust storms. This Western recovery program would employ hundreds of thousands of laborers to try to redirect water to the dried out regions of the country that were fueling the dust storm. Part of this plan also entailed developing rail connections to transport laborers to these projects, but this was something of an attempt to create new communities around these public works projects that would be catalysts for potential new urban centers, much like the industrial hubs that had risen in the north from the 19th century Industrial Revolution. All of this would be connected via rail and highway, but Long's vision didn't stop at physical infrastructure. His administration would launch what he called a war on disease, vastly increasing federal funding for medical research. The Mayo Clinic and other research institutions would see a dramatic expansion thanks to federal funding, with new labs springing up across the country to tackle diseases like tuberculosis. Long's goal was nothing short of eradicating widespread illness and improving the public health standards of an impoverished and malnourished population. And then there was the centerpiece of Long's agenda, the Share Our Wealth program. 
This radical plan aimed to redistribute wealth on a national scale, ensuring that every family had access to a house, car, and radio. We've already gone over his aims with Share Our Wealth and the changes to the U.S. tax code, but one element of the program we haven't mentioned yet is the mechanisms of transition that Long thought necessary to prevent the Depression from spiraling further. Long saw it of utmost importance to meet with the nation's top corporate leaders and business moguls. Long believed that these men, although powerful, could not stand in the way of the sweeping changes America needed. He also saw some of them as potential allies, most particularly John D. Rockefeller, who was nearing the end of his time and might be more susceptible to donating large sums of his fortune to philanthropic causes. A lot of the money from the revised tax code would fund other parts of the Shara Wealth Program. His government, progre his government promised free college admissions for those who scored highest on intelligence tests, as well as pre-vocational training for citizens to prepare them for the labor positions that would soon arise from his infrastructure initiatives and simply for jobs in the labor industry in general. Perhaps one of the most controversial aspects of Long's presidency was his plan to nationalize the Federal Reserve. By reorganizing its leadership into a board of directors, Long aimed to bring the nation's financial system under direct democratic control by reorganizing its leadership into a board of directors elected by the people of each state, effectively turning the Federal Reserve into a fourth branch of government that would be heavily checked by the others. This bold move would bring Wall Street and the nation's financial elite under the thumb of the people a stark departure from the way the economy had been managed in previous administrations. Some considered him to be quite the vanguardist because of this radical proposition, but for Huey Long, the presidency was more than a position of power. It was a platform from which he could transform America. Moving on from the economic issues, on the foreign policy front, Huey Long was squarely an isolationist. Unlike some of his self-described isolationist contemporaries, however, Long's brand of isolationism went beyond mere reluctance to engage in European conflicts. He viewed America's interventions in Latin America with deep suspicion, believing them to be driven by the interests of major corporations, particularly, again, Standard Oil. His speeches on the subject were passionate, even incendiary, and they garnered attention not just at home, but across Central and South America. This critique was perhaps most vividly illustrated by his stance on the Chaco War, which lasted from 1932 to 1935, a bloody conflict between Bolivia and Paraguay over control of the Gran Chaco region, believed to be rich in oil. For long, the war was a clear example of imperialistic meddling by American corporations. He accused Standard Oil of buying the Bolivian government, claiming the company had essentially orchestrated the war because Paraguay refused to grant it oil concessions. He declared in one of his speeches that, on this Memorial Day, we should understand that the imperialistic principles of the Standard Oil Company have become mightier than the solemn treaties and pronouncements of the United States government. His speeches made him an unexpected champion among many in the region, particularly in Paraguay. Throughout the summer of 1934, American diplomats waged a sustained public relations campaign across Latin America to disparage Long's name and counter his influence. Yet despite these efforts, his image as a defender of the Latin American people had already taken root. As president, it's almost certain that Long would have pursued this isolationist agenda, seeking to disentangle the United States from as many foreign episodes as possible, especially in Latin America. However, it's likely that one zone of American control would remain intact, the Panama Canal Zone, a crucial artery for both military and commercial activity. On a similar note, his brand of isolationism would most certainly involve the United States engaging in diplomacy with its European and Asian great power counterparts. Long had an eye for diplomacy with key allies in the British and French. There would be no cutting off the United States from its most important diplomatic partners. But there is an intriguing aspect of his relationship with Europe in this hypothetical administration, and that is the possibility of the United States forming a closer relationship with Italy under Benito Mussolini. Huey Long never had an actual relationship with Mussolini in our history, but in the media, he would both praise and criticize the Duce for his revitalization of the Italian state and economy. It wasn't just their overlapping economic ideologies, both men had populist beliefs and a penchant for grand infrastructure projects, and these could have aligned their paths. 
There's also the positive view many Americans, especially Italian Americans, held of Mussolini prior to the outbreak of World War II. In the late interwar period, Mussolini carefully crafted an image as the leader of the people, and this earned him a substantial amount of admiration in the United States. Through his propaganda, he depicted himself as a working man, a father figure for Italy, and a champion of Italian national pride. By the mid-30s, Mussolini had presided over an economic recovery that, while arguably flawed, still managed to provide jobs for most of Italy's poor. He had also mended the historically strained relationship between the Italian state and the Catholic Church through the Lateran Treaty, giving Italy a place of respect on the global Catholic stage. Mussolini's Italy also maintained relatively positive relations with the United States and other Western powers. Italian Americans were proud of their heritage, and Mussolini's regime was seen by the West as a stabilizing force in a Europe ravaged by the First World War. While his reputation would later, of course, be tarnished by his alignment with Nazi Germany and his government's role in the deportation of Jews and other minorities during the Second World War, Mussolini's Italy was, for a time in the interwar period, viewed as an important and even progressive player in European diplomacy. Given this situation and American media's relative admiration for the Duce, it's not a great stretch to assume that Huey Long, with his pragmatic approach to diplomacy, would have reached out to Mussolini cordially. We might even say that, rather than seeing Italy fall completely into the arms of Hitler's Germany, Long would have courted Mussolini, inviting him to collaborate with the Western powers. Mussolini, who had previously made overtures to France and Britain before being rebuffed, could have found in Long a potential ally willing to engage with him on equal footing. Perhaps Mussolini would have even abandoned the Rome-Berlin Axis Pact with Germany, only recently signed in 1936, and moreover, may have even avoided signing the Pact of Steel with Germany and Japan in 1939, which solidified the alignment of Germany and Italy's foreign policy instead opting for a more neutral stance as the Second World War looms on the horizon. For the sake of an interesting scenario, let's explore this train of thought and say that America becomes this bridging force that brings Italy to be accepted by the French and brought into the good graces of the Western powers. On a somewhat humorous side note, as a result of this, Long might even extend an invitation for Mussolini to join high-level discussions in New York or Washington promoting Italy's economic recovery model as a point of comparison to America's own infrastructure projects. This means Mussolini would have an opportunity to engage in a Khrushchev-style tour of the East Coast, perhaps making the rounds in large cities with Italian diasporas like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. While certainly not inevitable in this hypothetical, it's a funny thought. Now, of course, we have to touch on the fact that Long's admiration for some of Mussolini's achievements would have been tempered by his criticism of the Italian dictator's authoritarian methods. Long, in an interview with Time magazine, stated that Mussolini used inhumane methods to suppress dissidents. Long was also quite opposed to the concept of violent revolution as a means to make political change, obviously influenced by his upbringing in law and his familiarity with the American political system. This probably would end up being a point of contention during discussions with the Italians, but knowing Mussolini, this topic could easily be waved away and swept under the rug. We should also note that even an outstretching of an olive branch to Italy would be seen by some as a red flag. Already journalists opposed to Long's agenda had painted him as a would-be autocrat, likening him to Stalin or a Hitler-esque figure. Yet despite these accusations, Long had always rejected comparisons to Adolf Hitler and his brand of National Socialism. He was neither anti-Semitic nor especially anti-Communist, apart from the prevailing attitudes of the time. When asked about the comparison, Long dismissed it outright, saying, Don't compare that with so-and-so. Anybody that lets his public policies be mixed up with religious prejudice is a plain damned fool. As historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. would later note, Long's populist dreams were about economic fairness, not racial purity or nationalistic myths. An answering of the social question, not the racial question. Reeling things back in, let's get back to foreign policy. Unlike Franklin Roosevelt, Long had little interest in condemning Japan's aggressive expansion in Asia. His isolationist philosophy, again, dictated that the United States should focus on internal development and only engage with the world when there was a clear economic benefit. 
As a result, the oil embargo on Japan, which in our timeline contributed to the lead-up of Pearl Harbor, would never materialize. Long would continue to sell oil to Japan, meeting with their diplomats frequently and in reassuring them that America had no imperial ambitions in the Pacific. Under his administration, the Philippines would be granted independence, or at the very least, see an American military exit that would reduce tensions between Japan and the US. This leaves us with a crucial question. Would the Second World War even occur in this timeline? Or at least, would it resemble the conflict as we know it? It's likely that many of the initial sparks for the conflict in Europe would remain unchanged. Germany would still annex Austria, demand the Sudetenland, and sign the German-Soviet non-aggression pact with the USSR. When Germany invades Poland, Britain and France will still declare war. However, I might suggest for the sake of shaping things up, introducing the question of a neutral Italy. Let's suppose Mussolini would refuse to join Germany's war effort. This neutrality, though deeply frustrating for Hitler, would not be supremely consequential to the initial phases of the war. Additionally, without Italian involvement, the fighting could be largely contained to Northern and Western Europe, potentially minimizing conflict in the Balkans by preventing Yugoslav involvement for some time, unless the Croatian fascists still rise up as they had in our timeline. Furthermore, Long's America would not offer the same degree of support to the Allies. The Lend-Lease program, which supplied crucial aid to Britain and the Soviet Union, would either be drastically scaled back or not occur at all. This would leave the Soviets especially vulnerable on the Eastern Front, and without American supplies, they would struggle to hold back the German advance. Simultaneously, Japan might turn its focus northward, consolidating its control over Manchuria, China, and invading the Russian Far East rather than launching the island-hopping campaign that characterized the Pacific War in our timeline. The Philippines is still standing in the way of Japan's ambitions, but there's a possibility, albeit not entirely realistic, that the archipelago could be transferred into Japanese hands peacefully. Regardless, Japan and the United States would still remain on relatively good terms, and while Japan continues to expand its influence in Asia, it wouldn't provoke a direct conflict with America. Instead, the US would maintain its isolationist stance, occupying Greenland in 1940 on behalf of the Danes, without being drawn into the European conflict, as they had in our own history. There is even a chance that the United States might annex Greenland after the war, recognizing its strategic importance in the Arctic, though this remains a wild card in an already unpredictable scenario. Ultimately, World War II would probably end with a dual victory for Germany and Japan. Italy's neutrality, while initially a relief for Mussolini, would come back to haunt him. The Germans, having only cooperated with Italy out of necessity before the war, would see their neutrality as a betrayal. Meanwhile, the United States would remain isolated, its economy thriving, but its influence, of course, diminished on the global stage compared to our own timeline. The British Empire would survive limping through the aftermath of the war, with its power and prestige significantly reduced. As the dust settles, the world would find itself reordered under the tripolar hegemony. Japan, now the great economic power of the East, would engage in trade with the Americans. Germany, now free to reshape Europe in its image, would dominate the continent, and America, Britain, and whatever government is left in Russia would stand in between them. Without clear historical examples of such governments functioning over long periods of time, only time itself will tell if Long's America, Germany's Reich, and Japan's empire will all have bitten off more than they can chew. But let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this video or have any critiques or notes, be sure to leave a comment for the algorithm, and subscribe if you really liked hearing about Louisiana's almost dictator. You can support us on Patreon by following the link in the description, or by becoming a channel member with the join button below. Thanks for your time, this has been the US of Z, signing out.